Euh, je suis très heureuse aujourd'hui d'accueillir de, Julie Deschepas d'abord, de revoir aussi Annie Gérin, puis d'être avec Estelle comme, tout, comme, comme toujours, pour, euh, bah, presque tous les jours, en, en Zoom ensemble. Et puis aussi de voir qu'il y a quand même, malgré la fin de la session, un grand nombre de personnes inscrites à cette conférence internationale. Donc, bienvenue à toutes et tous. Merci d'être là. C'est vraiment un très grand plaisir, un honneur d'avoir aujourd'hui Julie Deschepers, conférencière invitée avec nous. Euh, moi, je suis Catherine Animayer, professeure à l'École des médias à la Faculté de communication de l'Université du Québec à Montréal. Et c'est donc au nom du CELAT et en tant que directrice du CELAT UCAM que j'ai le plaisir d'introduire aujourd'hui. C'est la sixième conférence de la série Les temps qui viennent. Le CELAT, c'est le Centre de recherche Culture, Art, Société fondé en 1944. Euh, il a changé de nom à plusieurs reprises depuis et il est constitué en tant que centre depuis 1975. Depuis 2000, il existe en tant que centre triuniversitaire et interdisciplinaire, intégrant des chercheurs de l'Université de Laval, de l'Université du Québec à Montréal, de l'Université du Québec à Chicoutimi et d'autres universités, dont euh, Concordia et l'Université de Montréal. La série de conférences, les temps qui viennent, fait partie de la programmation du CELAT, qui se concentre actuellement sur les différentes facettes de la pluralisation dans nos sociétés. Dans ce cadre, le CELAT UCAM a lancé cette année la série « Les temps qui viennent » afin de proposer un regard et une compréhension critique et interdisciplinaire des phénomènes culturels, artistiques et sociaux. Plus particulièrement dans le contexte actuel qui est celui d'une pandémie, d'une crise écologique et économique accentuée, d'un renforcement des inégalités sociales et d'une incertitude quasi généralisée, il nous semble important de continuer et de faire vivre les débats et réflexions qui doivent secouer nos façons de penser et d'agir sur les temps qui viennent justement. Et c'est donc dans ce cadre euh, et dans cette série que nous avons l'immense plaisir d'accueillir aujourd'hui Julie Deschepers en direct de l'Italie. Et c'est Estelle, vu qu'on est un public qui est multilingue et qui va à peu près dire la même chose en anglais, ça prend un peu de temps, mais voilà, c'est pour inclure tout le monde. Euh, Estelle Grandbois Bernard qui est coordinatrice du euh, CELA TUCAM. Merci. So thank you very much um, to all of you for being with us today and special thanks to our invited speaker, Julie Deschepers. Uh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui? Okay. Um, so I am Estelle Grandbois Bernard, coordinator of the CELA TUCAM, and I have the pleasure to introduce the third conference, well, not the third, sorry, the sixth conference of our series, The Times to Come. Uh, the CELAT is the Research Center uh, Culture, Arts and Societies. It was founded uh, in 1944 and became an official center in 1975. It is now bringing together three different universities, Université Laval, Université du Québec à Montréal et Université du Québec à Chicoutimi, and regroups scholars from these and other national and international universities. The conference series, The Times to Come, is part of the CELAT research program and has been launched this year by the CELAT UCAM in order to offer a critical and transdisciplinary perspective on cultural, artistic, and social phenomena. More specifically, in the current context of a pandemic situation, the reinforcement of the ecological and economic crisis, as well as of social inequalities and a sort of gener generalized uncertainty about the future, we wish to continue the discussions and reflections in order to shake our ways of thinking and to act on the times to come. We are very happy to welcome Julie Deschepers to this conference series and Annie Gérin, uh, Dean of the Arts at uh, Concordia University and member of uh, the CELATICAM. She will introduce our speaker, Julie Deschepers, who will then uh, present a conference around 30 to 40 minutes, and we will then have a discussion and you can ask your questions. Thank you very much, Annie. Oui, euh, bonjour euh, et merci euh, Estelle pour euh, l'introduction. Merci K Katharina pour l'invitation euh, aussi. Euh, donc, euh, je suis euh, Annie Gérin, doyenne de, de la Faculté des beaux-arts à Concordia et membre euh, du CELAT. C'est un plaisir euh, immense pour moi de présenter euh, Julie Deschepers aujourd'hui. J'ai rencontré Julie euh, à Paris il y a cinq ans euh, environ dans un café pour discuter de ses recherches euh, doctorales. Depuis, euh, nous avons eu des échanges réguliers. Euh, elle est même venue à Montréal euh, contribuer à l'enseignement dans, dans, dans mes cours euh, à l'UCAM euh, il y a quelques années. Et je dois dire que j'ai beaucoup d'admiration euh, sur la façon dont elle a réussi à tisser en très peu de temps un, un, un réseau euh, international et un programme de recherche qui est tout à fait passionnant euh, et original et qui ne cesse pas de, de se renouveler. 
Donc, euh, Julie Deschepère est assistante scientifique au Kunsthistorische Institut in Florence, euh, docteur de l'Institut national des langues et civilisations orientales, INALCO. Elle a soutenu en 2019 une thèse intitulée « Le patrimoine soviétique en Russie, acteurs, discours et usages 1917-2017 dont elle prépare actuellement la publication. Plus généralement, ses recherches portent sur les théories du patrimoine, en particulier les rapports au temps et à l'espace et la culture matérielle du socialisme. Son nouveau projet explore le destin des objets socialistes dans les collections muséales à travers l'Europe. Ses euh, travaux ont été publiés dans plusieurs revues et ouvrages, dont International Journal of um, Heritage Studies et 20e siècle. Euh, ses prochaines publications paraîtront aux presses de l'Université de Toronto et dans euh, le Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of Women in Architecture. Julie a aussi organisé plusieurs événements académiques et grand public. Elle a été co-commissaire de l'exposition « Naissance d'un patrimoine soviétique en France ». Et cette année, elle coordonne euh, les ateliers de recherche « She is made of stone, women in socialist and post-socialist public space ». Et elle co-organise la conférence « Temporality and material culture under socialism ». Avant de prendre euh, le poste qu'elle occupe euh, présentement au Coutts Historische Institute in Florence, elle a été postdoctorante Max Weber à l'Institut universitaire européen. Elle a enseigné à l'INALCO et à l'Université Paris 8. Elle est présentement euh, aussi co-responsable du réseau francophone de l'Association of Critical Heritage Studies. Donc, euh, sur ce, euh, Julie, je te passe la parole. Merci beaucoup, euh, Annie, pour cette généreuse introduction et je suis euh, extrêmement euh, heureuse et honorée d'être euh, là parmi vous. Merci euh, beaucoup d'avoir proposé mon nom pour, euh, pour participer donc, à, ce, à ce cycle de, de conférences et je voudrais remercier euh, particulièrement euh, Katharina Nemeyer et toute l'équipe du CELAT pour leur, pour leur invitation et Estelle euh, Grand Bois Bernard pour euh, avoir permis l'organisation euh, vraiment de, de la conférence. Donc merci, euh, merci beaucoup et merci également au public euh, d'être là. Et je vais maintenant euh, parler euh, en anglais. Nico. So I'm going to now switch in English and I would like to thank you um, again everyone for their generous invitation and Annie for her kind uh, introduction. And I'm really honored and happy to be here with you today. And so today I would like to actually to share with you some thoughts, reflections and considerations on a phenomenon that have been quite mediatized all over the world during the spring and summer 2020. This phenomenon is the global wave of contestation of public monuments glorifying difficult and let's say traumatizing past, especially colonial and racist legacies that follow the tragic death of George Floyd killed in Minneapolis by two policemen the 25th of May, 2020. And I'm gonna share my screen now. Can everyone see it? Perfect. So a lot has been said and written on this phenomenon. It was in the headlines of journals, hundreds of articles were published all over the world. And currently conferences are organized, special issues of journals are being prepared and call for chapters for collective books were recently circulated. Just to quote um, a few of them, for instance, the, um, uh, the next issue of uh, La Revue Racar, État des lieux de la commémoration corrigée en art public, quel avenir pour le monument? edited by Anaïs Alvarez Hernandez, Marie Blanche Fourcade and Lucie Morisset, but also two other books that I saw so will, will come in the next year, the commemoration, making sense of the contemporary calls for tearing down statues and renaming places, edited by Sarah Gainsburger and Jenny Woodstebeck, or again, another one, remembrance of thin cast monuments and memorials in the age of Take It Down, edited by Julia Decker. 
So hence, this wave of monumental contestation is, extremely, is an extremely topical subject. So why address this phenomenon again and from which perspective? As it was said in the very kind introduction, my work questioned the theories of heritage with a focus specifically on material culture, monuments and architecture. And I am interested conceptually and practically um, in the interaction between space, time and monumentality. I have been focusing my attention on the socialist space, more specifically the USSR. And this is why I was quite familiar with this kind of images. Here, you can see a photograph of a monument of Marx in Moscow, and you can see uh, two different ones with a few days of uh, difference between them. This monument uh, was built in 1961. Uh, it was considered as a historical heritage the same year, and um, it was also very central in Moscow, as it was uh, located near the Kremlin, so the center of the power, but also in the middle of um, uh, a square. And so this, um, this transformation, fascinating transformation of this monument occurred in August 1991. You can say on the left uh, photograph that the monument has already an inscription in, in Russian. This inscription literally um, says, proletarian of all countries unite, popularized in English as workers of all countries, of all world unite. And you can see that with um, painting, it was ended under, please unite in the fight against communism. So basically, the uh, here, the protester changed the, the meaning, the deep meaning of the monument. And a few days after, other protester added not only uh, a comment on the monument, but they made the monument speak. Because the, there on the right in the photograph, Marx is saying, please forgive me. Prastiti minya. And then I discover in June 2020 this photograph. It's King Leopold II in Brussels, and it's also written on him with a white painting, pardon, please forgive me, pardon me. And so, sorry, these striking similarities through space and time in the way monuments are used by protesters to express revendications and to try to be heard in two completely different contexts, and with two monuments obviously materializing different memories, invited me to explore this phenomenon that I will call later on the monumental decommemoration from a global but also trans-historical perspective. In order maybe, and I hope here, to provide an international and historical dimension to the contemporary discussion on monument. And my hypothesis that I would like to share with you is that regardless the geographical context or the history of the monument, it seemed that the, the practices, the gestures, or even the behaviors uh, from small alteration to total destruction of monument are quite the same all over the world. And I would like to focus then on these practices, on the gesture of citizen, of human being towards monument, in order to understand basically all the action that leads to this kind of photograph, a monument lying on the ground, and we cannot see anyone here, and we don't understand exactly what happened. And this is what I want to explore with you through space and time. And my hypothesis is that these kind of similarities in behaviors actually link somehow to what we can call the power of monument, of any monument. So what does monument change? To paraphrase the title of the third BNL conference of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies in Montreal in um, 2016. What does monument do and what do we do to monuments? And I hope today that I can contribute then to the huge field of research of the uses of monument. To do so, I would like um, maybe to explore three main dimension. Um, first, the idea and the, in, the interaction between monument and the public space. Second, the 
all this system that, that I will call the power of monument between visibility and materiality. And third, I would like to explore the idea of the engagement of the human body with um, a monument. And to do so, I will organize um, my presentation in three different moments. Uh, the first one, collapsing through time, monuments and transition. Third, uh, the second moment would be monument, space and body. And the third one, the afterlives of contested, um, of contested monuments. And first, maybe a small, um, a small consideration. Here, when I speak about monument, I will speak specifically about public monument and more specifically about statues, figurative statues of one individual or a group of people. And actually, um, we will see why the, the, the actions that were taken by protesters are focused on this kind of monument figurating one uh, person and not the ID or um, we will see a metaphor phenomenon, etc. And first, collapsing through time, monuments and transitions. Actually, what I would like to, to do here is just um, um, emphasize an idea that it's quite that, that is quite uh, well known, but um, just really putting it into into historical perspective. This idea is like uh, is that transform transforming the, the public space and use monument as material support for um, denunciation of an historical period and denunciation of uh, their memories is a constant phenomenon in history, especially during different kind of transitions, political transitions, but also social transition. Um, and more broadly, this transformation of the urban space is a proof of the evolutions of society. So of course it has been, I, I will take different um, examples really cho chosen through, through the time, but we can really have a broader um, perspective. The first kind of example will be uh, this kind of transformation of the public space after revolutions, for instance. We can just have a very quick look at the French um, Revolution and here the transformation uh, of the public monument and the toppling down of uh, monuments dedicated to Louis XIV or the Sixteen, so previous King of France. In another um, geographical and ideological uh, context, we can see, for instance, after the Bolshevik Revolution, transformation of, again, of the public space, during down monument. And here we have uh, the example with uh, three quite fascinating photographs of uh, the installation uh, and all the mechanism to uh, topple down the, the monument of uh, the Tsar Alexander III. So this would be in the context of revolution. So in um, brusque and sometimes violent transition of power, but also in different kind of um, political transition or in social movements, uh, you have also all the time this transformation of the public space. And I'm going to take other and just in maybe another example going again in another geographical context and uh, completely different also political context in Baghdad, 2003, uh, the monument of Saddam Hussein was also teared down. All these phenomenon are, all this movement of transformation are just this testimony of the evolution of the society and the need to change uh, the society in order to correspond to new um, political ID, social ID, cultural uh, vision of what should be the, the space we're living in. But what we could say that uh, maybe the turning point in the very recent history, and if we're going uh, to speak more about uh, the monument uh, contested today, was maybe this one in Cape Town 2000, um, 2015, the monument of the colonialist Cecil Road was um, was uh, 
double down after demonstration in the University of, um, of Cape Town. So you can see here the different, uh, different moment of the protestation and then the official dismantlement of the monument. And actually, it was after this movement that uh, we did observe an amplification on the debates around the monumental commemoration related to slavery, colonialism, systemic racism, marginalization of minorities and social inequalities. And the acceleration of this movement appeared um, uh, specifically in North America. I'm going to show you very uh, quickly different picture here in Dallas, 2017, Monument of Confederate General Robert e. Lee uh, disappeared from the public space. Charlesville, Monument of Robert e. Lee again, is hidden. During a night in 2017, a four monument to Confederate, uh, Confederate general were, um, were taken down uh, by the local government and disappeared from uh, the public space. In another context and in another uh, also perspective, the monument of Edward Cornwallis was also um, uh, taken down from the park of uh, Halifax in Canada in 2018. And just before the new wave of contestation what, that appeared after the death of George Floyd, just a few days, the 22 of May 2020, in France, in Martinique, in Fort de France and Scholcher, two monuments dedicated to uh, Victor Scholcher were also destroyed. All that to say, we could of course emphasize and go in details in every stories behind uh, this destruction. But the aim here is more to say that of course what happened um, in 2020 is not a new phenomenon at all first. And second, that it could more be considered as the climax of um, a movement that were already around the globe. And um, we can see some specificity, which would be first the global scale of the movement and the fact that this acceleration that we saw since 2017 also exploded and we had a concentra concentration of events Simultaneously, all monuments were torn down, or at least we had this sensation because the image produced and the, the image associated to it um, were uh, circulating all over the, the world, especially through social media. And so we had this feeling of complete acceleration, concentration of all these monuments taken down, whereas it was just maybe um, just the climax of something that was already, already happening. So the question behind this uh, phenomenon would more be, why do people use monument for revendication? Is this an efficient tool? And also, what are the similarities through uh, space and time in the treatments of monuments and why? And so this is my second part, monument, space and body. First, um, maybe very, very quickly, some, some theory on public monument, on the cult or the culture of monument, um, even though there is, of course, a um, uh, thousand of book written on the notion of monument, especially linked with um, memory, culture, heritage. But I would like to emphasize um, a few points in order to better defend my arguments uh, afterwards. First, let's say that um, monument and statuary first uh, are part of public art, even though the artistic quality of them is not the same all the time. Monuments, of course, do commemorate intentionally a specific memory, so chosen part of the past. They, con they do contribute to the construction of what we can call the collective memory as it was theorized in the public space. So they Sim they are symbols and they symbolically punctuate what we can also refer to the social play, the social space as Henri Lefebvre theorized it in the sense like every society has a conception of space and build is social space depending on his um, 
and different um, on, on different contexts, let's say, sterilized it, uh, speaking about the production of uh, social space for every uh, society. So, of course, monuments do contribute to this constitution of a specific uh, notion of space. But monuments are also related to time, as we said, not only to memory, but um, because they are chose to tell the story of the past, but they are also linked to the present and to the future. And we will maybe speak about this, um, uh, this specific relation to past, present and future uh, in the discussion. In that sense, we can maybe say that monuments are in one way the form of specialization of the memory and in other way, uh, kind of temporization of the space. You have these two elements which are really important. Monument contribute then of course to legitimize any kind of power. Uh, they do contribute to the appropriation of space and to the appropriation of time, of what is history and to control it. And of course monuments are not immediately heritage. They are part of what is heritage. However, there is somehow, and a lot of times, some kind of con confusion on a monument and implicitly it could be considered as a national heritage. And so um, here, this is also something that we can uh, discuss together during, during uh, the discussion, because I think that, of course, monuments are um, treated and sometimes taken as um, like attacked because of the monument itself, but also because they are part of the broader perspective of what would be the heritage of one society at one moment of their history. And of course, it's related to the notion of the contestation of heritage and the fact that heritage is uh, never, uh, let's say it's always a choice, it's always a selection. And so of course, um, uh, someone is excluded from this, uh, this notion of, uh, of heritage. Then from public monument, we go to monuments and public. And I will start with this um, provocative sentence uh, or declaration by Orst uh, Wandem, the president of the German UNESCO World Heritage Association 2013, who declared that a monument without visitors is no monument. And actually, this is really interesting when we see that um, actually um, today, of course, uh, monuments are the center of attention during this kind of uh, protestation. And so, of course, monuments do exist even without visitor, even without public. And we have different cases, for instance, in the Antarctic of monument, which are just put there in order to prove the appropriation of the land. But of course, in terms of visitors, you don't have the same kind of attraction as a monument, which will be in the center of a huge um, uh, European city, for instance. But what is uh, important here and what we, we can grab from this quotation is, of course, that um, a monument will be given as no sense um, on its own. It's never transparent, as, um, as wrote Annie Gérin, for instance. There is, is of course, it doesn't, it doesn't speak for itself. A monument is silent, even though sometimes you have some um, quotation on it or some text which can give some indication but it's always a multi-faced narrative just in the sense like you have uh, everyone has its own interpretation of it and i like this expression of uh, chiara agrilis speaking about the cubist portrait in the sense like you have always um it's uh, always different kind of interpretation so of course a monument is given a sense by the person or the group of person or the community who is observing appropriating or rejecting it but the propriety the property of monument which is really interesting for us uh, is the fact that monuments are tangible they are material so uh, even though the material can, uh, you know, especially nowadays, uh, be very different depending on, on the monument, the fact that we can feel them, we can sometimes touch them and give a importance, we live with them. So basically they, they are part of our 
common understanding of the, of the space, but we also do interact with them. And um, uh, I just wanted to, to, to show this, um, this picture in, in Paris, for instance, when people go toward this monument of Michel de Montaigne located near La Sorbonne, touching his foot um, to have luck for the exam, for instance, and you have uh, uh, all over the world this kind of monument that you can touch and will, you will have a specific interpretation, not of the monument itself or the history of the monument. This is not the history of Michel de Montaigne here that is interesting. It's more the interpretation that you can grab from it the fact that you can use it and you can um, basically have a personal relation to this material artifact. And so this material artifact is multifaced, of course, it's tangible material, but it's also visible. Um, and the fact that actually we can see and touch them are one of the main properties and main facts that they are used uh, during protestation. Indeed, it's part of the power, because when you do uh, interact with the monument, you 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 put, and we will see that um, in a minute. You change it, you you write on it. You can uh, put something different, some paintings. Of course, you do change its uh, regime of visibility. It's not the same, but it will change, and so it will attract your eyes. And the, social, the sociologist uh, Sarah Gainsbourg has this sentence very interesting, the fact that actually we do not care uh, sometimes about monument, uh, except when we have a personal relationship to it. But it's only when they are modified, with something short is modified, uh, some painting, uh, something put on it, that we notify it. So. It's only when we change the way that we see it that it become really interesting. And this is why also the images that were spread all over the world were um, shared and shared again. It's because the power of the images that create um, the monument. But their materiality is also maybe one of the very important uh, points as they can allow um, to engage practically um, physically our body with the public space and this um this thing is particularly important because there is um this kind of feeling of empowerment when we um uh, let's say interact or attack or destroy or change uh, a monument because we can feel that there is some material change so your protest is associated with materiality, with something that really move, change, is seen. And so you have the impression that there is somehow an impact on not only on the word and the revendication. So of course it's illegal, of course, and we will see it's, it's violent, but is it um, efficient and why do, and actually how can we, uh, the, the point is of course not to judge, but to analyze, but the thing is, interestingly enough, is that the monument is always um, a political choice, is, uh, as we just saw, is part of uh, an appropriation, legitimation of, um, of a, uh, let's say, a dominant history at a certain moment of time. And so the fact that protesters here, citizen, people, are using monuments in order to express political opinion is actually just the reverse of the mirror sense of what uh, is a monument uh, when it was created. So basically it's using the monument for what it is and po a political instrument located in the public space. And so uh, speaking about empowerment, for instance, during uh, the um, protestation and the, the displacement of the monument to Cecil Road in, um, in Cape Town, uh, journalists reported that uh, the student, for instance, were yelling in the crowd the, um, the word power. They were taking power over, um, over the history by taking power over the monument. And we will analyze this um, in a minute. So that being said, then, what are really the similarities that we can observe in space and time, and I will here, of course, choose uh, several examples from um, 
today, but also from different region in the world, just to just to 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 show you how we can really see this um, and we can really uh, see these similarities. The first thing really important, which is completely linked with what I, uh, I've just said, is the use of the let's say speciality of the monument. The more important a monument is, the more central it is. Because of course the space, a monument, uh, as I said, has not the same meaning if it's front of a public building or in the middle of a garden, for instance. And so during a protest, and especially the recent protest uh, during the movement of Black Lives Matter, the really the idea of gathering um, really near the monument and then circulating around it is linked with the presence of the monument, of the importance that was given previously in the public space by the person who ordered it, uh, the government or the political regime. And so here, this use of the speciality of the monument is quite interesting. And I really like uh, this, um, this picture, for instance, that show this idea of the gathering towards uh, and the running towards, or even here we have the sensation that people are really moving yeah, toward the monument and, and doing a circle. So basically the monument is influencing the way people are moving around it. So of course it's not absolutely not specific to uh, the movement um, the, and the protest that appeared after, uh, after the, the death of George Floyd. But there is something here that, was, that is quite interesting in the fact that in political protests, people are gathering toward this kind of monument because they are referenced in the cities, but also because they somehow do create this kind of engagement of your body going toward this monument and moving around it. So here in completely another context, you can see exactly the same phenomenon, but we can take basically different kind of, um, uh, of example of uh, protestation through space and time. But this uses of a very central and very high monument and people gathering, uh, gathering around, them, around it. The second moment, uh, usually after this moment of, of gathering, but or the moment of protestation is a very symptomatic thing, which is somehow a dialectic between the desacralization of the monument and in the same time, its rehumanization. I will explain it with picture. Here in September 2017, Chris, the monument of Christopher Columbus um, has seen his uh, nail uh, painted with um, pink nail polish, for instance. So the monument is of course ridiculed. You have the use of humor as it was um, really emphasized in, in different works. But here the idea is really to make fun of the monument or to use or, uh, or to exactly to desacralize it. In Ukraine, um, Potesta put um, uh, specific um, shirt uh, this water is specific from uh, from Ukraine in order to it's here you have somehow the humor the cre creativity but also the idea of um, really uh, using the the monument and rehumanizing it in another context you can see that progressively the monument, you are not making fun anymore of the monument, you're trying to hide it, to hide especially the face. So you're hiding the person behind the monument. Progressively, the monument is rehumanized and you don't want to see it. It's not, and more, um, and progressively, it's not the monument as a materiality. It's the person, of course, it embodies or it materialized. And more generally, it's the ideology that is, or the, political idea or the memories of one historical period that is denounced progressively. And you can see here in different, again, in different contexts, exactly the same gesture. And we can see that he's appearing, of course, the use of painting and especially, and especially red paint. And we will analyze this in a minute, but it evokes, of course, blood. So, Usually when we speak about this kind of destruction of, uh, of monument, uh, usually we speak about destruction or treatments of monument, we speak about iconoclasm. And um, 
Iconoclasm refers to the idea of changing the image of, it's an expression that refers particularly to the idea of changing an image. Whereas um, I do prefer this expression by Emmanuel Furex of semiclasm, is the idea of changing the deep meaning of something by transforming it. And so here we are changing the meaning itself of the monument by this, pro by this process of both desacralize and rehumanize it. And so, of course, all these gestures I made are meaningful. You can see that it's an intending act. It's not just violent for violence. There is somehow a performativity. It's a creative process in order to regenerate something. And the phase we are in right now is the idea of what do we do afterwards? What can we propose afterwards? Because uh, indeed, the idea is to transform or to change the public space in order to propose another vision. And here, um, in, in a lot of different, different contexts today, we are kind of blocked um, in this uh, perspective. The, in order to emphasize this idea and this meaning of um, acting on monument, we can, of course, um, speak very briefly about the fact that people do also write on monument, as you can see on this one. Or in Moscow in 1991, you can see that Potestum wrote uh, different kind of words on monument evoking the Bolshevik period and evoking first uh, on, on the right side, the violence link with the regime. So the person is um, described um, as a violent person, but also the violent, it's also the, vi of course, the violence of a regime itself that is denunciated. And just after, interestingly enough, here you can see that it's not written on the monument itself, but something is put on it in order to add somehow another layer of interpretation of, um, of the, the monument. And it says, whereas we are at the end of the um, Soviet regime, in the, in the USSR still exists at, the, at this moment because it's August 1991, but it's saying that we are killing, um, basically we're killing the Tsar. So, you have all these kind of imaginary link with the words used on, on monuments. Here on the same monument um, uh, on, that we saw previously also in Moscow, you can see different, uh, the, this mix um, intervention on the monument, both with painting, we can see young people writing fascism on, on the monument itself, or just putting some pages of journal. You can go a bit quicker here. Uh, because you got the idea. Churchill was a racist. This monument in Baltimore, 2017, that um, Robert e. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson were terrorists. And of course, it's written in white, whereas Black Lives Matter is, is written in black. And so you have this use of colors. And of course, the red is very present. The red evoke the blood. And you can see here on the monument of Christopher Columbus, this use of um, this use of blood. And we arrive in the moment of violence and somehow the revenge uh, toward both the figure that is materialized by the monument and the memories of the historical period. Christopher Columbus here has blood on his hand that we can see with uh, the red um, the red painting. And so these blood both emphasize the horror that are associated with this act, but also the blood of the victims. And so here you have another actor which enter uh, into the space. In French Guiana, in Cayenne, the monument to Victor Scholcher is also painted in blood and a syringe is inserted in his hand in order to symbolize the, violent, the violence made to the victim, to the slaves. And you can see afterwards, you can really see the violence here linked with the monument, the idea of killing the person a second time. This idea of killing the person, again, is really embedded with this idea when we when monuments are tripled down and you have these symbolic um, images with really um, the monument that are hanged this way or 
even decapitated, as we can see with Christopher Columbus or with the monument to Josephine in Fort de France in Martinique. And then you have the moment of violence toward the monument that you can see here in the right that usually follow the moment of destruction. There is the moment where the emotion start from the really the, the joy and usually in different video what you can see is people yelling are really happy jumping on a monument but also destroying it a second time and this kind of very of course violent image are the one going around the world here in baghdad you can see also of a monument um, and and people really attacking the monument again and after this moment of violence you have Another moment, which is the one of people taking control of a monument and of a history. And it's materialized uh, usually when people are going on the pedestal or just after the dismantlement when they place itself at the equal level as the monument. Or when there is no monument, they are taking the place of the monument. You can see here in completely different context in Baltimore 2017 and here again in Moscow or in Lithuania. In Lithuania. And once you have this moment of taking the power, you want also, and it's, it was really uh, meditated lastly, that monument, uh, you want to make them disappear and to take so much the control over, over it and over the history that you want them to disappear completely. And the movement of putting them into the water, so make them disappear even using the um, environment is really fascinating because it's really, you are burying again with, um, with water, which is somehow a phenomenon that had that is fascinating, but that here, uh, of course, um, this is an extract from a video that was really spread all over the world of uh, the monument of Edward Colston in in Bristol. And here, uh, it's a monument to Christopher Columbus in the U.S. And so here you can really see that actually people do interact exactly the same way with monument, with the same treatment, not necessarily in the same order. But it's linked, obviously, with the visibility of the monument, with its materiality, and with the fact that monument can be an efficient tool to express revendication. But of course, they are never sufficient, because what is the next action is actually to take political action, political, economical, social, educational, financial, action in order to complete this uh, gesture that just put the emphasis on the fact that there is a fa fracture into the society. And so the need to, to listen to actually, it reflects the fact that people need to be heard and there is a need to, to, take, to take action and to do something. And uh, I will explore, um, because I want to, to leave space uh, to the discussion, so I will maybe not analyze, but just give a few examples from the um, socialist um, space that what could be done with monuments afterwards, not the, um, uh, what can be done once uh, with, the, with, the, with the materiality of, um, of the monument. And it's something quite well known, but I just wanted, uh, it's maybe some, um, some basis for uh, the discussion I hope we will have afterwards. And the, the main idea of what I wanted to say is that uh, between the idea of leave the monument or destroy it and make it disappear, there is a large range of possibility, of course. And taking an example from uh, a huge space that had to deal with a lot of material heritage from um, a contested past, it's quite interesting to see what, what, what were the solution adopted just to have somehow an inspiration. So, of course, the idea of displace, reorganize and re-specialize monuments. Moscow, putting monument in front the displaced displaced monument from one place to another and place them in front a museum but not inside 
And here I see a really um, a similarity between this image of monuments that are encircled because we don't know what to do with them. There is this moment of uncertainty. And in Baltimore, 2017, when the monuments, you can see that they are somehow imprisoned and we don't know what to do with them. They are lost in, in the nature. In Moscow, um, I just wanted to say very briefly that, for instance, um, uh, other monuments were put also in this, uh, what is called now a park of statue, which is something very, uh, very usual. And just for the pleasure of the eyes, maybe some picture of this kind of re-specialization of a monument, of monument from the socialist period. And here, uh, quite an example of what can be could be called a counter monument, placing a monument of Stalin, the one you saw before that were laying down, with a monument behind to the victim of uh, Stalinism, and more broadly, that is called here the victim of totalitarian regime. Another kind of solution still linked with the idea of um, uh, respatialize and re uh, give a new sense to, to monument, the Memento Park in Budapest, Hungary. Um, you put the monuments outside the city and you reorganize them and you replace them as only the status of um, piece of art. Of course, replace a monument um, here in Prague with an artistic intervention that can evoke both um, the past, the present, and the future of the new society that is wanted. In Kiev, here, leave the pedestal empty in order to maybe leave a moment to think about the future of the society. And the other part is Kiev, and the other one is Zaporizhia. Of course, the idea of museification um, and one, and here uh, in the Lenin, the Lenin head, which is very famous from the ex GDR, placed in a museum where you can touch and speak about the monument and um, sense their materiality and have uh, different uh, discussion and interpretation of them. Of course, uh, artistic intervention here in Sofia, Bulgaria, reinterpret a monument dedicated to the Soviet army with humor, and in Ukraine, here you can see also some kind of humor and reinterpretation. But basically the idea, uh, there is no good, sol no perfect solution because every solution should be linked, of course, with a specific context and a dialogue should be engaged with local communities, absolutely, in every context to have a discussion, to have a debate. Because of course, the way, um, the way we are looking uh, at the past is evolving. So in every democratic regime, there should be place for a discussion about what is the past, what is the memory of, um, of the past, and what kind of future do we want to build. And with this, um, I will end with uh, this proposal that is now uh, famous of uh, Bansky, for instance, to propose a monument uh, monumentalizing the fact that people were uh, tearing down the monument uh, to Edward Colston in Bristol. And so this could be the idea of a monument looking toward the future, changing what is the look uh, to the past and looking toward a new perspective for the future. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. <laughs>